So uh, what we're doing in the second hour here is we're getting an overview of Paul's epistles. Last week I handed out the outline of 2 Corinthians. We went over the first five chapters last week, so then we'll start in chapter 6. Uh, basically, as I mentioned up here, the theme I've got, the theme of 2 Corinthians is enduring suffering for faith in God's Word results in walking in the Spirit and God's love being shared with others so that they may be reconciled to God. So the Corinthians have advanced beyond the point of just stop doing bad things that he told them about in 1 Corinthians, but now he's getting them to uh, actually build on that faith, build the love of God in their hearts through having the doctrine, sound doctrine, work through them, and then if they share God's love with others, then they may be saved as well. Um, that's what we covered at the end of last week, that chapter 5 there in 2 Corinthians where it talks about we've been given the ministry of reconciling others to God. He says that in 2 Corinthians 5, 18. He's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And the way we do it, we don't just give people the gospel and have them believe, although that's how it works, but it also, primarily they see the faith in the doctrine working through your lives. And so certainly, as E.C. mentioned, if we trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sins, we have eternal life. And we only have to hear that and believe it, and that's as simple as that. There's no requirement of works. There's no requirement of attending church or putting money in the offering or doing good deeds, none of that stuff. Uh, you receive eternal life just by trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins. However, uh, people are more likely to believe that message if they see God's love coming through you. If you are living a life that doesn't demonstrate God's love, if you live just like the heathen do, well, then they're less likely to believe that message. And so um, he has in 2 Corinthians, of course, Satan is going to be attacking those who would spread the truth of God's word and stand for God's word. So there's the suffering that's involved. And so... Um, the theme in 2 Corinthians is to continue to endure that suffering, that God will comfort them through that, and that if they continue to endure, then God's love will uh, be an uh, outgrowth of that suffering. And so not only will they have the faith and the doctrine, but they'll have God's love. Once they have that, then people will see uh, the doctrine working through their lives, and they're more likely to believe the gospel. So that's pretty much the theme of 2 Corinthians. And so now we're in chapter 6 here, and uh, you fill in the blank there is uh, living out sound doctrine in the midst of trials is how we separate ourselves from unbelievers so that people will believe the gospel. So it's living out sound doctrine in the midst of trials. Um, anyone can have a good attitude when they've got money in the bank and everything's working for them, got good health and uh, you know, good weather and everything, uh, all the circumstances are favorable, and you don't have any problems whatsoever, uh, you, can, you can be happy and have a smile on your face at that time. But when, you've, when you're enduring trials, when things are going wrong, and you still have that same attitude, uh, that smile on your face, and you're still trusting in God's promises to you, even though it seems like they're not being fulfilled because of what's going on around you, well then, that separates you from the unbelievers. And so then people are more likely to believe the gospel because if they see you're doing well with your attitude, when things aren't going well, then they'll say, well, you know, maybe there is something to believing in Jesus' death as atonement for my sins. Maybe there is something to that it, because it changed people. As E.C. mentioned, that's the power of God into salvation. And that power of God working through that person's life allows them to have a joyful attitude even though things are going wrong in their life and so then people are more likely to believe now, the key verses there if we go down to verse 4 in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 4 uh, he mentions about the suffering there and even in the midst of the suffering to still hold fast to the truth of God's word rightly divided to have faith in the doctrine that we've been given for the mystery dispensation uh, 2 Corinthians 6 Verse 3, he says, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. So don't have people to be offended in the gospel. And you do that by, ha by holding to faith in God's word and having that joy of God coming through you 
despite suffering. So in verse 4 he says, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. So how do you approve? How do you show others that God has that the power of God to give you salvation, to give you joy? Well, then you have the joy through the tribulations. He says, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. Verse 5 says, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. So you have all this um, suffering that they go through, and the result then of the suffering is verse 6, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Those verses there, you see the contrast there, especially when you get down to verse 9 and verse, verse 8, you know, where he's talking about known, uh, unknown but yet well known. Dying, behold we live, chastened, not killed, sorrowful, rejoicing. There's that contrast, and the contrast is between the flesh and the spirit. So they're going through these trials and tribulations in the flesh, and they're suffering. They're going through these things, but yet the spirit is alive. You have faith in what God has told you, and it's working through you such that even though in the flesh you're sorrowful, in the spirit you're always rejoicing. Even though in the flesh you're poor, in the spirit you end up you're rich, with all blessings and heavenly places, but because they see, people see the joy of God in you through these trials, then the result is yet making many rich. So then people, you know, it's one thing to just present the gospel, but it's another thing for people to see you living out the gospel. You know, um, you see mentioned Romans 1.16, well the next verse says in Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. And so if when through all these trials, if you're living out the faith of God working through you, well then others see it, and then the result is they're made rich. Not in the things of this world, but they're made rich spiritually because they see that things, even though circumstances are not favorable for you, they see you still have the love of God being shed abroad. You still have the joy. You still have the peace that passes all understanding. You have all those things, and then they say, well, there must be something to that gospel that was preached. And so I'm going to believe that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and rose again. And then I can have eternal life in heaven, and then I can have joy and peace, even though things are not going well. So that's how you make many rich. It's just by living out the doctrine through trials that come your way. And so that's the, uh, the fill in the blank there, living out sound doctrine in the midst of trials. Um, a key verse that I put on your second page there is verse 14. I mention this because usually verse 14 is only used in the context of marriage. Uh, it says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. People usually just take verse 14 and they'll say, well, that means you shouldn't marry an unbeliever. Um, Paul addresses marriage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He's already dealt with that issue with the Corinthians. As I mentioned in 1 Corinthians, he's dealing with the things of the flesh and trying to get them to overcome that. 2 Corinthians, he's moving on. The doctrine, having the faith work through it so that they will be willing to endure through suffering. So when you get to this passage here in 2 Corinthians, he's not talking about marriage. He's rather talking about you know, the fellowship, the communion that you have with others. And he's basically saying that if you have people in the church or other people outside the church who claim to be Christians, uh, he's really talking about those people, those who do, are unbelievers in the sense that, you know, they've already trusted in Jesus' death as atonement for their sins, but they're unbelievers in the sense that they're not allowing Pauline doctrine to work through their lives to build up the faith and the love and the hope 
And he's saying without the faith, love, and hope, we don't have the fellowship. And he said, you know, why would you try to have this concord with other people who call themselves Christians? And maybe they are Christians, but they don't have faith in God. They're just um, you're trying through the works of their own flesh, or maybe they're just uh, using you know, whatever, using grace as an excuse to sin, whatever it is, the point is that if you're going to separate yourselves through enduring trials so that people see the love of God working through you so that they will believe the gospel and have eternal life, part of that is also <coughs> separating yourselves from those who do not believe sound Pauline doctrine. Even though they may be saved and you'll be with them in heavenly places for all eternity. If, they're, if they've, all they've done is believe the gospel and then they get into religion after that, then you don't have fellowship with them because they, they're following a religious program rather than following God's word rightly divided. So I wanted to mention that because a lot of times that verse is just taken out of context and used for marriage when really he's already dealt with marriage in 1 Corinthians. He's going beyond that here in 2 Corinthians. So then chapter 7 um, the, we mentioned the trials and going through them. Well, then the result then is you, you see people that are, he said, yet making many rich. So you see people who are saved, or if they're already saved, maybe they come into the knowledge of the truth. You see them growing in the doctrine. And so then the chapter 7 then, uh, you fill in the blank there, is that joy comes from seeing spiritual growth. Joy comes from seeing spiritual growth. Um, People, a lot of times, there's such a great focus, especially in a material world like we're living in today's age and in the United States, even in our Constitution, it gives you the right for the pursuit of happiness. And there's a lot of emphasis on people being happy. Um, there's nothing wrong with being happy, but that's not where our focus should be because happiness is relying upon happenstance. That's where the term happy comes from being happy in your happenstance or your circumstance that is around you. Joy, though, comes from within. It's an internal thing that's as a result of the doctrine. And that can come about regardless of the happenstance or the circumstance that surrounds you. That's why Paul says rejoice evermore. He doesn't say, oh, you know, rejoice only when things are going good. He says rejoice evermore because regardless of your circumstance, you still have eternal life with God. You still have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Uh, you still have the riches of God's grace that He's going to give to you for all eternity and through all the ages to come. And so you can have joy in that. And in chapter 7 here, we see Paul, regardless, even though he has trials going around him, he has joy and it comes from seeing the spiritual growth. And that's a result of him going through those trials and the love of God being shed abroad through him. There in chapter 7, uh, you see in verse 4 that he is joyful even though circumstances are not favorable. It says, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. I mean, that last phrase there seems like a, a contradiction of terms. How can you be joyful even though you're going through tribulation? And the reason is because the joy comes from within that doctrine. And, and you can see in this chapter, he gives some examples of how he, as a result of seeing spiritual growth in others, people being saved and coming into the knowledge of the truth, then he uh, has joy. In verse 5, uh, you see in his flesh there are tr there's trouble. He says, for when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. So he's got trouble. He's got tribulation going on. Nevertheless, verse 6, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. And the reason is because... Uh, well, we'll keep reading verse 7. Not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. And now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, 
that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Uh, there's a lot there, but basically the overlying theme that he's telling you about is that in verse 4 he had tribulation and he was joyful. Uh, verse 5, he's got more tribulation there, but yet he has more joy because he sees the sound doctrine being worked out in the Corinthians. They're believing it, and there's a change in them. And um, it, he's talking about in that first, in verse 8, about he made them sorry with a letter. That's in reference to 1 Corinthians. They had a lot of things they were doing that they shouldn't have been doing. Uh, sexual immorality within the church. Uh, taking others to court, um, the problems with marriage, they're stealing food from each other at the Lord's Supper when they had that. They had a lot of problems going on. He writes the letter to address them and he sees spiritual growth come out of them and that they, they repented from them. They were sorry uh, that they did it. And he says in verse 10, he says that that was a godly sorrow. Um, the world sorrow, as he says at the end of verse 10, the world sorrow of the world worketh death. And that's that's really the sorrow that a lot of people have when they get caught. You know, somebody uh, does a crime um, and then they are arrested, they're thrown in, in prison, and then they end up apologizing to the per people they did the crime to. Um, those people usually are not sorry and, you know, have any genuine uh, sorrow that, that they did that and they're not going to do it anymore. They're just really sorry that they got caught because if they didn't get caught, they would have done it to somebody else. And that type of, the, the sorrow of the world works death because it puts you under a work system. You're saying, well, I'm sorry because I got caught, so now I'm going to, in my flesh, try to overcome. Uh, not that I'm going to be good, but just so I won't get caught again, so I won't suffer the punishment. Godly sorrow, though, is, is based upon faith in the doctrine that we have in Paul's epistles. Knowing that we have, we already have eternal life. We don't have to, as you know, the illustration of in the flesh, where you, where you, you're sorrowing, you don't do that crime anymore because you don't want to get thrown in jail again. Uh, for us, we don't have to worry about that. We have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We're already seated with Christ. We're already made alive. We already have eternal life, as far as God is concerned. So if we do something bad we don't do it so that I mean we don't come out of that so that we won't get caught again rather it's a the godly sorrow has to do with realizing that God has loved us he's given us all these blessings and therefore we are going to set aside the flesh walk in the spirit and allow the spirit to work through us and that's how you have this repentance to salvation in verse 10 uh, he's not talking about a conditional salvation as far as your eternal life, that, well, if you don't have godly sorrow, you lose your salvation. Rather, he's talking about uh, salvation from the flesh. That if you have this godly sorrow, recognizing the doctrine, recognizing you're already seated with Christ in heavenly places, you already have eternal life, you've already got spiritual blessings, then out of love for God, you will yield your members of your flesh over to God and allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. And so then you are, you are saved from that flesh, uh, works of the flesh, that religious system of trying to do better. And you end up following God as a result uh, by Him working through you. So uh, that's the difference there between godly sorrow and the sorrow of the world. The sorrow of the world is under a legalistic type system. The godly sorrow is under... Uh, grace that we have. we're not under the law as Romans 6 14 says we're not under the law anymore but we are under grace so under that system we rec we have godly sorrow um, and allowing God to work through us which brings that repentance there so Paul even though he was suffering in the flesh he ends up having joy because of what he sees the transformation in the Corinthians of how they have turn toward faith in God to allow it to change their life. It's not a system of legalism like the Galatians get into, but rather it's a system of having faith in the doctrine. Uh, so that, and so even though then you have trials and tribulations that you go through, Paul here has joy. He, you know, in, in verse uh, uh, 9, he says, Now I rejoice 
Um, so you have this joy within you regardless of the tribulation. Verse 4, he says, I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. So that's the point of chapter 7. Uh, then in chapters 8 and 9, he's uh, the fill in the blank there for 8 and 9 is that there tends to be an inverse relationship between material and spiritual wealth. Uh, therefore, give cheerfully of your material wealth to increase your joy. Uh, that's really what he's getting, basically what inverse relationship between material and spiritual. That means that uh, the general theme there is that usually those who have a great amount of wealth and riches in this world, you know, millions of dollars in the bank, the fancy homes, the fancy cars, the people who have that tend to trust in those things and not think of the spiritual. And a lot of times the barrier that we have in the United States of people believing the gospel is the fact that they're of the material prosperity or relative to the rest of the world. You know, if you don't have, you don't know where your next meal is coming from and you sometimes end up not even having a meal because you can't afford it, uh, you're more likely to look at those things and trust in God, uh, seeing that, well, you know, maybe this flesh isn't as important as I thought it was, um, the spirit, you know, make sure the spirit is fed and have trust in the gospel and believe that and have eternal life. But if you have riches, you have a lot of money, you have cars, you have houses, you have land, you have all these possessions, uh, you're more likely to say, well, why do I need God? I'm just, I'm doing just fine as it is. So then you've got all the material wealth, but spiritually you end up being poor because you haven't had faith in what God has said. Uh, so it tends to be uh, the reverse there. And that's what he's talking about in chapters 8 and 9. In chapter 8, verses 1 through 7, he talks about the churches of Macedonia. Uh, how they ended up, they didn't have much money, uh, but they ended up giving an offering uh, because um, the, the saints in Jerusalem there, the saints were poor. We mentioned that a few weeks ago about how uh, the saints under the kingdom program we're told to sell all they have and give to and, and give that away and they had all things in common well they didn't have the material riches anymore so then when God starts the dispensation of grace um, the kingdom doesn't come in so now that well they don't have any money where are they going to do so the churches and that Paul writes to uh, he encourages them to give of uh, their material wealth to help the poor saints in Jerusalem who have given up everything they had to follow to bring in the kingdom only to find out that due to the unbelief of Israel, the kingdom isn't coming in just yet. And so he's, he's done that. The church in Macedonia here, in chapter 8, verses 1 through 7, materially speaking, did not have a lot. And uh, he actually, but they raised an offering. They said, bring it to the, the church in Jerusalem. And Paul was very reluctant to take it. He says, well, I'm, you know, you don't have much. But yet they gave. And, and so the Corinthians, though, were just the opposite. The Corinthians were wealthy materially, and as a result, uh, they didn't have a lot of spiritual wealth. They didn't have faith in Pauline doctrine. They had faith in the riches of this world. And so they, weren't, they hadn't really given an offering. And so now he's trying to give them that general principle, as I mentioned in chapters 8 and 9, that if you're willing to give up the material, then that helps you spiritually. And... Uh, chapter 8 verse 10 we see that the Corinthians one year before Paul wrote this epistle had promised to give an offering and they had not done it yet it says in chapter 8 verse 10 herein I give my advice for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do but also to be forward a year ago so in other words a year ago they intended to give this offering they haven't done it so he tells them in verse 11 now therefore perform the doing of it that is, there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. And now in verses 12 through 15, we're going to see that inverse relationship between the spiritual and material. He says in verse 12, For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and you burdened. I know it's verse 14, he says, But by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want. 
that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. So, in other words, the poor saints in Jerusalem, they don't have a material wealth, but they have an abundant spiritual wealth because they've had faith in what God told them. I mean, it takes, you know, you can say that you, you believe what God says and what His Word says, but when God, when Jesus commanded them in Luke 12 to sell that ye have and give it away, and to have all things in common, and they actually did that. I mean, that's that's literally putting your money where your mouth is. That's where you're literally following the doctrine, and you're willing to give away all that you have to follow what God says. Um, that's what they had done. So their abundance is in spiritual wealth, having this abundant faith in what God had told them. Materially, they didn't have much because they had given it away. By by contrast, the Corinthians were just the opposite. So what Paul is telling them there in verse 14, that there should be an equality. At this time, your abundance, that's your material abundance, may be a supply for their want, which is uh, material want, that their abundance, spiritual abundance, also may be a supply, spiritual supply, for your want, that there may be equality. And then verse 15, as it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. Uh, so the idea there is that the Corinthians, it's and you know the way he presents it is a lot different, I should say, than what you'll hear in Christian churches. A lot of times churches will get up and if they've got a giving program, they want to build a new building or they want to open up a satellite church or they want to do get on television or whatever it is that they want that's going to cost them money. A lot of times it's presenting you with, okay, they're trying to guilt you in, into it. They're saying, oh, God's going to do great things. We're going to build this new building. We're going to start this new ministry. And all we need is 100 people to commit to giving $100 a month. And then after a year, we'll have, you know, and they, and they build it up here. And they sort of think, you know, if you're not giving, then all these great things that God wants to do through you isn't going to happen. And God's not going to bless you. And He's not going to prosper you because you're not giving. But Paul doesn't do that. He's really showing them the, the, he's, it's the benefit, the spiritual benefit that will come about. He doesn't guilt them into it and saying, look, these guys, they sold everything they had. They got nothing. You got all this money. You know, why don't you give them some money? He's, but he's really showing them, not guilting them into it, but showing them how it benefits them by giving. Uh, you know, the, it's interesting that in, in the book of Acts, I think it's the only quote of the Lord Jesus uh, in the book of Acts uh, after he had already ascended to heaven there we're told there he said it is more blessed to give than to receive and that's the true meaning behind that it's not that you know if you give away everything you have well that's what kind of blessing is that you you don't have anything left you know it's the opposite but spiritually speaking it's a blessing so he's telling the Corinthians he's saying you need to give not to help them out but to help yourselves out because you're in this spiritually weak condition you've got a want a spiritual lack uh, 